Listener Production. Hi there, I'm Sasha Barbagat. Welcome to this episode of The Briefing. Well, it is official, this month kicked off the federal government's ban on the importation of all non-therapeutic vapes into Australia, meaning anyone selling vapes now needs a licence to bring it into the country. And if you want to buy a vape, you need a prescription to do so. This is part of an ongoing effort from the government to try to fight the growing health impacts of unregulated vapes flooding the market and having potentially lifelong impacts on the health of Australians across the country. But will less accessibility to vapes accidentally push people onto the smokes instead? The Federal Health Minister Mark Butler joined Benson Siebert to explain why the government is so focused on lasering in on vapes this year. Mark Butler, welcome to the briefing. Thanks, Benson. So the federal government has now banned all non-therapeutic vapes importing into Australia and you're hoping to outlaw selling them from July. Give us the elevator pitch. Why are you cracking down on vapes? Well, this is a serious public health menace, particularly targeting young Australians with one simple objective in mind on the part of big tobacco, and that is to recruit a new generation to nicotine addiction. And tragically, it's been working. So we're determined to stamp it out. Um, It's been illegal to access nicotine vapes without a prescription since 2021. Who or what level of government has been responsible for the enforcement failure there? Well, I think there's been a bit of duck shoving between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments for too long here, with some justification, frankly. Uh, You know, from the state and territory point of view, these things were flooding in over our borders because there was no import control put in place by the former government. Uh, And so state and territory authorities said, well, it's a bit difficult uh, for us to enforce something when they're flooding in from overseas on the one hand, and also there is this loophole that you alluded to about whether or not a vape is a nicotine vape or a non-nicotine vape. Almost all of the vapes that were flooding in uh, to the country from overseas were either labelled non-nicotine or not labelled at all, so that when there was a seizure, either at the border by border force or uh, on the ground by state and territory authorities, the vape would have to be sent off to a laboratory for testing to determine whether or not it was a prohibited sale or or it was okay. So we've also decided to close that loophole down. We know, frankly, it it was a fantasy. These things are almost always nicotine vapes. That's why they're on the market, to get the nicotine hit. And from Big Tobacco's point of view, to recruit people to nicotine addiction. According to research commissioned by your department, about 20% of 18 to 24-year-olds vaped as of last year. It was 2% in 2019. This is a pretty major failure of government policy, isn't it? It is, and you see it right around the world. I mean, this thing really got away from us during COVID as as it did in many other countries around the world. I mean, let's just step back. This this product's really only been on the market for a number of years and it was sold as a therapeutic product. So something that would help hardened smokers who'd been smoking cigarettes for decades, so generally middle-aged and older people to kick a habit they've been trying to kick with, you know, more traditional products like nicotine patches and nicotine gum and all the all the rest. That so was sold as a public good, as a therapeutic product. But some years in, we now understand exactly what it is. I mean, if you have a look at these things, they're brightly coloured, they've got ridiculous bubblegum type flavourings. I mean, these are very much targeted at young people and not just young adults. I'm talking high school children and increasingly primary school children. Nine out of 10 vape stores are located within walking distance of schools. And that's no accident. It's it's a deliberate commercial decision by these stores because they know that is their target market. We spoke to Jamie Hartman-Boyce last week. She is an associate professor at Oxford and co-author of some of the really high quality international research about vaping versus smoking. I asked asked her whether it's reasonable to worry because I'm a person who has a lot of friends who vape and they used to smoke and now they vape. Is it a reasonable thing to worry about that they're going to go back to smoking? 
I'm worried about that too. Um, and I think lots of people are worried about that. You know, we know anything that's making someone return to smoking is not going to be good for their health. So you've banned the import of vapes. You're hoping to stop the sale of vapes in July. How many vapors does the government expect to return to smoking as a result of these policies? Well, I will say I share that fear and it's something I've been talking to public health people and tobacco control experts about really since we started this discussion shortly after I was appointed health minister after the 2022 election. I mean, the last thing we want to see is the very large number of vapours shift into cigarettes or in the case of some of them shift back to cigarettes if they were previously smokers. We already know that vapours, young vapours are three times as likely to take up cigarettes as non-vapors. So, you know, it is a gateway into cigarettes and that frankly is the strategy of big tobacco. So it should be no surprise that that's the case. But as we go down the path of trying to stamp out the availability of these products, particularly for young people, we have been concerned to make sure that people who do need vapes for therapeutic reasons continue to have that availability. So to one of your descriptions that we're, we're banning vapes altogether, that's not strictly right. What we are doing is returning to what the experts describe as the therapeutic pathway. So for people who whose doctors or nurse practitioners say, yes, there is a therapeutic reason for you to have access to vaping, that will still be there. If anything, actually, what I did a few weeks ago was to broaden the ability for people to go to their doctor, go to their nurse practitioner and say, look, I'm concerned. I've got a nicotine addiction. I don't want to go back to cigarettes or I want to get off cigarettes. And vape seems a, a better alternative for me. And and if the doctor agrees, then you will be able to get that through a pharmacy on prescription. But these will be pharmaceutical style products. They won't mm. have pink unicorns on them. They won't be disposable, causing the most awful environmental mess that we're already seeing. They won't have bubblegum flavours. They'll be plain flavours. We'll be able to regulate the chemicals in them. They'll have a prescribed nicotine content rather than the, the broad variability of nicotine content that we see in the disposable vapes that are coming in right now and returning really to what we were promised this thing was all about, which was a therapeutic good. Is that something that you got advice on before you announced the policy? We had a number of roundtables to look at two things. Um, firstly, the the plain packaging laws around cigarettes that uh, we'd put in place when we were last in government were about to expire. And what we found was the industry had adopted a whole range of new marketing tactics to make cigarettes attractive, particularly to young people, to get around the intent of the plain packaging reforms that we put in place a decade ago. Sure, but on the question of whether people will actually go from vapes back to smoking, is that something that you commissioned advice on before you announced the import ban and also the the ban on sales? The reason I talk about our smoking regulation is because the advice we received was very much you need to do both at the same time. Uh, so if you are going to start to cut down the supply of vapes, then you also need to deal with the fact that the cigarette industry had made cigarettes more attractive over the last several years without any regulation of that. So we've been doing both. And certainly every public health expert, every tobacco control expert, the last thing they wanted to see was that regulation around vaping would, would lead particularly a whole lot of young people to move to cigarettes. So that has been utterly at the forefront of our mind. Is there a, a set of modelling? Is there a number? Is there a proportion of people that you expect to return to cigarettes as a result of these policies? None of the experts have been able to put a number on that. We're determined to make sure that that doesn't happen and put as many supports uh, in place for people who do have nicotine addiction. You know, one of the very serious concerns we've had right through this process is we don't just squeeze the balloon and see a whole lot of people go back to cigarettes or, in the case of young people, go to cigarettes for the first time. We know that vapes can be very dangerous for your health, but we also know that cigarettes are worse for your health on current evidence. Why crack down on vapes in this way and ban their sale when you're not doing the same for cigarettes? You know, a lot of the tobacco control experts that I was talking to, and I posed that question, that very question, Bensian, 
their response, and I think it's it's a legitimate one, if if somewhat fantastical, is if we could go back in time 100 years with the benefit of hindsight, consider regulating cigarettes as it was being introduced as a mass recreational product, I think governments would do something very different to what they did 100 years ago. And we're very concerned that this product is deliberately being targeted to young people. Yeah, I mean, if you look at vaping prevalence in 30, 40, 50 year olds and above, it's very, very small. I mean, this is this is essentially a product being consumed by young people. It's causing them harm in and of itself. Sure. But the question here is, you've got one product that's very, very dangerous for your health. You've got another product that's dangerous for your health. <clears throat> Why are we banning the sale, aside from prescription, of the less dangerous product and we're not banning the very, very dangerous product? Cigarettes are something that's been around for decades, very different uh, addiction profile in the community. Vaping is still a relatively new product. We think we still have the chance to stamp it out as a recreational product and we're taking that chance now. And I think since we've announced the measures, you've seen other countries who had originally been, I think, taken by the suggestion from industry that we should just regulate this product like we do cigarettes I think they're coming around to the idea that, no, actually, we need to take a much heavier hand with vapes. Now, around cigarettes, other than that younger age cohort where I said smoking rates are going absolutely in the wrong direction, we're still seeing smoking rates coming down in Australia more generally. Like The daily adult smoking rate we found from data released last week is down to about 8%. You know, when I was born, which is some time ago, uh, three quarters of adult males smoke. We have one of the best uh, records in the world on driving down daily smoking of tobacco, and and we and we've got a very c- clear plan to continue getting that rate down to five percent by the end of the decade. So we think we've got the right strategy for tobacco, but this new challenge of vaping we think needs to be stamped out before it gets very deep roots in the community, the sorts of deep roots that we've seen for for many decades, cigarettes. Mark Butler, thanks so much for joining us on The Briefing. Terrific to be with you, Bension. Thanks very much. That was Federal Health Minister Mark Butler speaking with Bension Siebert there. And that is it for The Briefing today. We'll be back in your feed again from 6am tomorrow. But in the meantime, we are always keen to hear your feedback as well as the stories you'd like to hear us cover. To send us a message, search The Briefing Podcast on Instagram and hit us in a DM with your thoughts. I'm Sasha Barbagat. Thanks for listening. Listener.